Well, good evening, everybody. Here we are again, live on Christ Church's Facebook page. Uh, haven't seen people join in yet, but I hope you are are uh, starting to join us. It's uh, it's just a minute till, but uh, it's good to have you. Okay, Nancy Hart is the first one to join us tonight. Good to see you, Nancy. <clears throat> Vicki Malone's joined us. Uh, Becky just came running in. I think I heard sirens coming, following her, but they went on by the house when she ducked in. Uh, she'd just been at the at the church for the first in a long time rehearsal of our uh, of our praise team. So it was good to to get that going again. They've been doing uh, those things on uh, at a different time. Here they're back to Wednesday night rehearsals. And uh, so we, we've been, been happy to, to see our reopening happening this Sunday, June 21st. Uh, I want to reiterate that we're going to be doing live streaming again and just going to continue doing that because based on our poll, there are a lot of people who say, I'm just going to wait for a little while before I come back. But coming back this Sunday, we're going to have uh, commons and sanctuary services at 930, 1115, which is different, but 1115 and uh, also at 1 o'clock, two new services, Commons and the Sanctuary. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful s Sunday of worship. Just as a reminder, if you are coming to worship in person, wear your mask. Don't come if you get up Sunday morning and you're not feeling well, you got a cough, you're running a fever. Uh, just do a little check and don't, don't come if you're not feeling well. Uh, remember, a hospitality team member will seat you whether you're in the sanctuary or the commons, we have to do that to maintain our safe distancing and get as many people into those spaces as we can. Be patient with us. We we think we've got this figured out. We've got a hospitality team all trained and ready to go. We did that last night. Uh, but we want to keep everybody safe. One thing, I may have kind of slipped through the cracks. We've been talking about it a little bit in the last week since last Sunday, but this is really important. Uh, please bring with you an index card or just a slip of paper, the back of a business card, uh, whatever you want to write it on. Write down the names of the people in your family who are going to be who are coming on Sunday and a phone number, and drop that in a basket. You'll see uh, the, one of the hospitality team members will be collecting those. If you forget it, don't worry about it. We'll we'll get your name and, and contact number there. But it just speeds things up if you bring that with you. And you say, well, why do they need that? Well, the reason is if someone in one of our services works at test positive, then the health department does contact tracing and having those names is very helpful to make sure they get to anyone who may need to quarantine or be tested. And uh, it, it helps to make sure that we do stay safe. But on the other hand, it also helps uh, us to limit uh, the impact on that worship service. If we do this right, we wouldn't have to shut down the whole worship service for a couple of weeks. Rather, we would just make sure that the people who came in contact with the person testing positive was contacted for follow-up. One other thing I want to mention before we get into our Bible study tonight is something we're calling our church-wide summer Bible challenge. Uh, we, I made this announcement last Sunday, but all I said was you're going to hear more about it this Sunday, and you will. Uh, it's really going to be neat. We're uh, going to have a sermon series in July on the four P's of the Bible, people, places, parables, and prayers. And so our daily devotions each week will be on one of those four topics. The sermon will be on one of those four topics. And uh, if you're not already on our daily devotions, jump on there and get those uh, coming to you every day, or you're, you can see them on the church app and we're changing it this month so that instead of just for adults, it's for children and youth as well. There'll be challenges for them with activities and things. And Kathy Baker and I are doing a 30-minute video on Sunday afternoons uh, to, uh, to sort of set the stage for the week. It'll be a short 30-minute video that uh, Kathy does one, then I do one, Kathy, and then back to me. So if you're doing this in a small group, I see Paul Wagner's on here tonight. If a, you're doing a small group that's doing a Zoom uh, uh, class lessons, it'd be great to use this Bible challenge for your 
study material and those videos hopefully will help you as a family or as a class to get prepared for the next week. Uh, it's good to see Nelda Thompson. Man, we got a bunch of people on here. Uh, looks like we're up to 24 right now and 25 and the number keeps growing. Good to see everybody here. Uh, I do have Becky here with me tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, she came speeding in from uh, from uh, praise team rehearsal down at the church. Uh, let's get into our study now. Uh, those ads don't cost you any extra. They're thrown in for the price of the Bible study. Uh, last week we were doing chapter 9 in Mark, and we studied the transfiguration of Christ in which Jesus uh, changed in appearance uh, and stood talking with Moses and Elijah. We said this was on a mountain. We're not sure which one. Uh, it have, could have been Mount Hermon, could have been Mount Nebo. Uh, but him appearing there with Moses and Elijah, that's really important. It shows Jesus in the context with God reaching out to people in the two most powerful ways God had done that previously. Through the law with Moses. I'm, I'm sorry, with Abraham. Uh, no, with Moses. And... Uh, through the prophets. Um, the, the prophets, God had spoken most directly to the people. Now, in the most direct way possible, God has sent God's Son to be a, a one among us. And this really affirmed Jesus as He contemplated going to Jerusalem to die for us. We, we said God spoke and said, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to Him. Um, uh, we remember how God said a very similar thing at Jesus' baptism. But there was a difference. Somebody tell me what was different about uh, what God said or the way God said it at the Transfiguration than uh, Barbara Whitaker just joined us. Good to see you, Barbara. Uh, how it was different, how he said something different at the baptism than what he said at uh, the Transfiguration. Again, at the Transfiguration... Here before these three apostles, God said, This is my Son whom I love. Listen to Him. You remember what He said that was different at His baptism? Um, the difference is um, at the transfiguration Jesus is referring to the apostles when he says uh, yes he, he says I'm pleased he said that at the baptism that's exactly right this is my son with whom I am well pleased uh, he's talking to Jesus at his baptism at the transfiguration it as, it, it, uh, as if he's talking to the apostles. He wants them to hear that this is his son. Uh, not you are my son, but this is my son. Excuse me just a second. Somebody's trying to get on and having <laughs> having a tough time. Let me respond. Uh, I, I apologize for this, but this is somebody who's wanting to get on the Bible study. I'm going to text to say, go to the Christ Church link. I want everybody on here that I can get. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, he's, he's talking to the apostles, and that would have been very affirming to Jesus, but it would also have been really reinforcing to them, this really is my son. This really is the Messiah. Uh, with Jesus, remember at his baptism, Jesus was just... Uh, uh, beginning his ministry. This was the first act where he's baptized, immediately goes away to be tested, and then goes into his ministry. Uh, okay, Barbara, uh, somebody is saying that their link didn't come on until I actually came on. 
Um, and that may be what this other person's having difficulty with. I hope they hope they get on. Um, now Jesus is about to finish, complete his ministry on earth. And I think this was uh, on both ends. It's kind of like bookends. At his baptism, when Jesus said this, I think it said, yes, the time is right. I need to step into my ministry. Here at the end, it's like God is saying, and Jesus is getting that, yes, it's time to go to Jerusalem. Uh, we, we see the effect that it had on Jesus almost immediately. He turns and heads toward Judea. He's been in Galilee. Mark, if you've noticed, all of Mark so far, Jesus has been in Galilee. Some of the other Gospels talk about him going to Judea, around Jerusalem, back, down and back. I think it's John that tells us about three different Passovers that Jesus celebrated in uh, uh in his ministry, which that's why we say Jesus was ministering for three years, from about the age of 30 to about 33. Uh, three Passovers are mentioned. We uh, we only hear uh, in Mark about this one Passover that he's going to, and it's the last one. Uh, Jesus stopped off at Capernaum, which has become his home, uh, and from there he heads on toward Judea, which is down south, if I were labeling tonight's lesson, I would call it Galilee to Judea because he's going to go on this trip going south. Uh, he'll cross the Jordan. He'll go south. He'll cross back over the Jordan into Judea. First place he's going to come to is Jericho, the team uh, that went uh, as pilgrims from Christ Church to Palestine in February. kind of went down that southern side of the Jordan at one point and then... Uh, we went right through the city of Jericho. Uh, in fact, we saw a sycamore tree there and looked for Zacchaeus, but didn't find him. Uh, okay, chapter 10 includes the journey to, uh, to uh, Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 11, which we get to next week, he's going to arrive in Jerusalem for his last week uh, on earth. All right, Becky's all set, ready to read uh, Mark 10, 1 through 12, please. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as he as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you, he replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Awesome. I see the person that was looking for us on Facebook Live is on now. That's great. Good to have you. Uh, <clears throat> now, let me ask you a question. What is the, and I'm going to wait for an answer on this, so somebody answer me. I want you to note the Pharisees' purpose in asking the question. They ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Uh, and you notice also that he's already coming into the region of Judea. Uh, he's crossed the Jordan and people are gathering around him when the Pharisees come with this, uh, with this question. Why do they ask the question? There's a lot of reasons why people ask questions and they've got, they've got a reason. In fact, Mark tells us why they're asking.
Yes, Michael Smith's first one, Jenny Wilson. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trip him. Uh, they're trying to, yes, everybody's answering right. They're testing him. They, they want to test Jesus. Um, and if they can get him to answer in a way that'll turn the crowd against him, uh, they're, uh, th th that's success for them. If they can get him to say something that'll get him into trouble, that's success for them. Uh, uh, and, and Jesus is he's much too wise for that. They are not asking to gain information or to learn. He's still going to be confronted, and we're going to see this just in a minute. He's still being confronted by some people who come wanting information. They want teaching. They're searching for truth. This Pharisee is not. By the way, a Pharisee was someone who, who believed that we, we get eternal life by earning it. We do enough good stuff. We obey all the rules that God will love us. Uh, they, they became very judgmental because they wanted to, felt like they had to be better than other people. Uh, I wonder if this Pharisee had in the background of his mind what Herod had done, taking away uh, Herod's brother's wife and had uh, taken her as his own wife. Uh, that got John the Baptist uh, killed because uh, Herodias, Herod's, Herod's wife, uh, kind of tricked Herod into doing that. And I wonder if that's kind of in the background of this Pharisee's mind. Maybe I can get Jesus to say something that'll get him into trouble. Notice how the Pharisee asked the question, coming from that male-dominated culture, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Uh, women couldn't divorce husbands. It's sad, but they were treated like property. And so it was up to the man. And by Jesus' time, it had become extremely easy for a man to divorce his wife. He went in public, he de declared a decree of divorce, paid a, a fee, and that was really about all that it, that it took in their culture. And so now he's asked, is it legal or lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus listened carefully. He answered by saying, what did Moses command? Now, by asking that, he's asking, he's answering, you tell me, what is lawful? And then he went on to acknowledge that their law permits divorce. But he said it was because people's hearts were hard. In other words, that's not what God intended. But because people's hearts are hard, it's in other words of saying that people aren't always faithful in marriage. Because of that, there's this opportunity and the, the law laid out what had to happen in order for a person to be granted a divorce and what the Adultery was grounds, for example, of, for divorce. But then Jesus does what he so often does and goes beyond the law. Now, he says something here that's very beautiful about it's why a man leaves his, his parents. He goes and, and lives with his wife. They become united forever. Uh, there's a, The first part of that phrase is in Genesis, but Jesus has added to it. And we quote that sometimes in our, um, in our weddings. You hear that, that expression, and it comes from here in, in Mark or one of the other Gospels. But Jesus goes beyond the law, as he so often does, and states the intent of marriage. It's not that there's this opener that says, okay, if you have a hard heart, you're unfaithful, you can get a divorce, but says it's a union of God joining two persons together, and it's a union that should not be broken. Later, or in a different situation, when somebody says, ask about uh, killing someone, it's like, yeah, you. no one does that, should do that, but it's more than that. You shouldn't call your brother a fool uh, about committing adultery. No, you shouldn't even, of course not. You shouldn't even think lustfully of another person. So he's doing that same thing here. And it's one of those cases where uh, we're told something may be legal, but it's not right, okay? He's making a difference. Becky, if you would, pick up with where you left off at verse 13 and read through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child 
will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Wow, isn't that a touching, beautiful scene? This is um, this is gives us such insight into uh, Christ's personality, but he's also teaching as he does this. Uh, I want to ask you something. I'm, again, I'm going to wait for an answer. I was telling Carol Millard last night, it's still awkward for me to sit here and wait for your answers, but I'm going to do that. Why would the disciples rebuke people for bringing their little children to Jesus to bless them. Now, why would the apostles do that? Um, I was telling Carol, it, it takes seven seconds for my voice to get to you because of it floats around in cyberspace a little bit and then gets to you. And by the time you hear it, uh, I've, I've been sitting here waiting seven seconds. And then uh, it takes some of you at least a half of a split second to start typing. But uh, I'm just going to be patient. Why would, Why on earth would people say, no, no, don't bring the, those children to Jesus. Don't, don't be doing that. Uh, we might do this uh, more uh, today, but uh, yeah, Nancy's already answered. Uh, in Jesus' day, even much more than today, children were to be seen and not heard. Uh, children today have a much more... Uh, prominent place in the family uh, when when you're trying to decide what you're going to have for dinner a lot of times the children are making that choice or especially if you're going out to dinner uh, in Jesus's day they they were they were not uh, didn't have that prominent place and so the apostles looked at it like these these kids are pests they're going to be bothering Jesus he doesn't have time yeah there we go Paul said uh, they were viewed as lesser important than adults and here don't be bothering the the rabbi, with these little children, we've got adults that need to be taught. Uh, Jesus is busy. He's got more important things to do. See what's on their mind? They're trying to take care of Jesus, manage his time, be good uh, disciples for him. There are not mean people. When we hear this sometimes, we think, man, what, what mean, ornery people. They weren't that way at all by this. They thought they were caring for Christ. They were trying to help uh, help him. But Jesus loves little children, and he spent the time taking them into his arms. Um, yeah, Dan, in their culture, they were supposed to be silent. They were supposed to be, uh, uh, like I said, seen and not heard. Uh, I love, we haven't been able to have vacation Bible school this year. We've, we've done a, a kind of a, a scavenger hunt and some things online, but we weren't able to do vacation Bible school in our space because of the virus. But um, when we are able to have that, it is incredible to see how our space, the sanctuary, the atrium especially, uh, the gym, and even the classrooms just get absolutely transformed. Mary Beth will get a team of volunteers who come down and work on Saturdays for a long time, putting together uh, scenes and props. Uh, one year, the thing was about the theme was about space travel. And my goodness, you would have thought you were in a, you know, on an Apollo moon flight. It was, it's incredible. But the children just get transported into that world. They love the decorations. They love the games. They love how the lessons connect with that. They are amazed at things that we kind of come to ignore. And when Jesus says, if you want to come into the kingdom, you got to do it like these little guys. You see how he's using them? I have this image it says uh, he took the children in his arms. And it's easy for me to go from those words to seeing him sitting with them in his lap. Uh, you know, how many of them, I don't know. But I just have a feeling he's covered up with these squirmy little guys. And he says to the crowd, you got to be like these children to get into the kingdom. Think about it. Everything they see, they see with wonder and amazement, curiosity. They have thirst for learning new things. They have, they're so innocent. They assume that everybody and everything is okay, almost to a point that that's, that's dangerous. They're very vulnerable. Jesus is telling us to assume a lot of that innocence and that uh, curiosity, that thirst for learning new things that children have so that we too can receive the kingdom of God. A beautiful way to tell us that. Becky, if you would, pick up now at 17 and read through 22. 
And by the way, this man is not asking a trick question. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Wow. This man is not asking a trick question. He's not trying to trap Christ, but he conveys whenever he comes up to ask his question, a sense of urgency and sincerity. What, do, what happens here that tells us that this man is in a hurry for an answer? He may think that Jesus is moving on, and so he's, I've got to catch him before, I, before he moves on out of, my, out of my area. But how do we get the sense from what Mark tells us that this man feels an urgent need to ask his question? And secondly, that it's a sincere question, one where the man really is seeking an answer to it. What does Mark tell us that conveys that? Yep, uh, someone's answered here. He came running up. Uh, he runs to Jesus. He, yes, uh, Joanna's saying he fell on his knees. Yes, others are answering that. Exactly right. He really wants to know something. And falling on his knees is he's subjecting himself uh, to Christ. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's his way of bowing and, and, and lowering himself to this great teacher. Right away, there's a lesson in the way Jesus handles this. Instead of just jumping to the answer, uh, Jesus says, uh, hang on a second. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, don't, don't call me good. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, in South Sudan, I've, I've taught pastors there on a number of occasions, I think on five different trips. Uh, Nathan is, is on tonight, I believe. Nathan has taught there. And in South Sudan, they have this neat little custom. They've learned it in school. But whenever they go to ask a question, they hold up their hand and you say, yes, Pastor John, and Pastor John will stand up. And then he says something like, Pastor David, we so appreciate your coming all the way from your country to our country to teach us today. It's kind of like he gives a little thank you speech. And then he says, I wonder if I might bother you with the question. And, uh, you know, and at first that's kind of cool to hear all that. But after a while you want to say, just, just give me your question. <laughs> but nobody's bowed to me yet. But they show this kind of honor and respect, and we need to make sure that people know that we represent Christ. There's nothing that special about us, right? Uh, in the church, those of us who are, are uh, pastors or those of us who have some kind of title teacher or whatever, uh, we have to be careful not to let people put too much credit on us and always point back to Christ as, as, uh, as Christ is doing, pointing to his his father. Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. Uh, you're being a bridge to God whenever we point back to, uh, to God and give God credit. Uh, Jesus reminded the young man of the commandments. You know, we got these commandments. You have to obey those. But the young man has done that. Uh, and I read and understand this, that the young man was sincere. Um, this young man is not being arrogant. He's not boasting. He's tried to live a good life. He has followed the commandments. He's done his best, uh, except there's still something missing, and Jesus knows that. The thing that's missing is the relationship between himself and God that Christ can offer. 
there's this legal thing about, well, I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen anything. I've never coveted anything. Okay, there's something missing, and it's this relationship. Love God, love people. And the part about loving people gets into one of this young man's priorities. I think Jesus knew that. Uh, he does know that. There's no doubt about it. He says to him, there's something holding you back. What is holding him back? What's keeping him from loving his neighbor uh, as himself? Remember, the greatest commandments, love the Lord your God, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, equal to the first, love your neighbor as yourself. What's holding this young man back? In a legal sense, in fact, the Pharisees would say, he's got it made. He's, he's got eternal life. And Jesus is saying, you lack something. What is that one thing that he lacks? Oh, yeah, he's got this issue of the love of money. Uh, his money has obviously become, uh, it, it's a, I like to think of it as, a, as an idol. It's become his, yeah, his fortune has become his, uh, his what he looks to, his wealth. Uh, it, it sets his priorities. Uh, there is absolutely uh, nothing wrong with theology. And Jesus could have said, uh, "I want to teach you the Apostles' Creed." <laughs> you know, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, flip over here to uh, to the commandments and let's read through them again. Jesus could have done any of those things, but he doesn't. He tells the young man to do something very difficult. And uh, yeah, Troy Bearden says the security of money. I think that's a whole lot of the issue here. Uh, so often. Money becomes for us what we, what makes us feel safe and secure. It's okay to save money. We're, uh, Jesus never said that there was anything wrong with that, but it can't become our source of security. It can't be our priority in life. He tells a young man to do something very, very difficult. He says, sell what you own. Give it all to the poor and come follow me. Uh, wow, for any of us, he, I think he is saying, may not be our money. Get rid of whatever it is that controls you. Free yourself of your other gods, those things that have become your priorities. For some of us, it may be, it may be uh, watching too much TV, or it, it may be, a, uh, it may be a, a sport or a hobby or something that's just consuming us. And Jesus would say, give that up. It doesn't mean we can't have hobbies. Obviously not. But and. And I don't think he's telling all of us to give away all of our money, but we have to be really careful that our security, our priorities are not based in our 401k or whatever money we've got. He uses the analogy that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I think he got a good laugh out of that. Um, when Jesus said that about, you know, judging others, he said, man, why do you... Point out the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye when you got a two before sticking out of yours. I think you got to laugh. Jesus tells us in the last chapter to be the salt of the earth. And part of that, I think, is talking and acting in a way that helps people to smile and see things. Uh, there are different explanations for this camel going through the eye of a needle. One of the gates into the city of Jerusalem was very narrow, and uh, and sometimes it was called the eye of the needle. And some scholars say well that's the that's what he's talking about you had to unload your camel if it carried cargo you had to unload it lead it through the eye of the needle and then carry your cargo in a piece at a time uh but it's interesting the way this is if you look at the different gospels uh the greek word that mark uses for needle is the sewing needle that a tailor would use it's something interesting luke was a physician and uh the Greek word that Luke uses for needle is the same as a suture. <laughs> you know, when, when Luke heard that, he thought, ah, sewing up skin or flesh. Uh, but those guys are definitely thinking about a needle, the tiny, tiny little eye in a needle for thread or whatever to pass through. No way for a camel to go through that. It says the disciples were amazed at his words. Uh, that teaching is amazing to them. Because in their culture, and sometimes in ours, they thought that if a person was wealthy, they had been blessed by God. 
Sometimes we think that. They're rich, man. God loves them. And Jesus is saying, actually, God's not like that. Uh, we've already talked about this a little bit, but uh, it's hard for a rich person to get to heaven because of our priorities. It is so easy to set our priorities not on loving others, using our wealth to help other people, but on using our wealth to make things better for us. <clears throat> or maybe to pile up more wealth. Uh, and, and so, Jesus says it's really difficult for a wealthy person to enter into heaven. The apostles were really confused now, and they said, so who can be saved? And Jesus says it's impossible with people, but with God all things are possible. When Christ died, Christ died for all, the rich too. This young man who ran away, Jesus died for him too. Okay, Becky, if you would, we're going to continue that thought with 28 through 31. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution, persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Um, it's such a human reaction that Peter expresses here. Uh, it's so typical, too, of Peter to speak up kind of for the other apostles whenever he says, but wait a minute, we've left everything to follow you. Uh, Jesus has just talked about trying to get somebody who's wealthy to give up their wealth, and Peter says, <laughs> we gave up everything. We left what we had. What did Peter give up? Think about it. He and his brother Andrew were fishermen. Uh, they gave that up. That, that's a commercial fishy, fishing business that they left. They left their nets and their boats, and they're on the Sea of Galilee, and they followed. And Jesus responds to this very human reaction by saying, in this life, whatever we've given up, we're, that's going to be replaced uh, we're going to be blessed in the time to come with eternal life. Whatever we've given up, that will be more than compensated for with the blessings in eternal life. Uh, but the priorities and the values are all flip-flopped. He says, many that are first will be last, and the last first. Who? Here he's lifting up the marginalized. Think about in our society. The ones that we think of or that society, maybe we don't think of them that way. I'm not being accusatory, but, but that society thinks of as being last, least. They, he, he's saying, will be first. Those that we think of as first, those in power, those with wealth, perhaps the last. Uh, Becky, if you would, read 32 through 34. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. When we are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Okay, you get this scene. They're walking along. The twelve apostles are there. The rest of the crowd is all crowded around them. Those are disciples who are following with him. Uh, Jesus refers to going up to Jerusalem. And from a, from a topographic standpoint... They're going to go up when they get real near Jerusalem because it is on Mount Zion. But they're actually going to go down from the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley before they go up. 
But uh, whenever a person says going up to Jerusalem, it's more of a spiritual comment than it is a geographic or a topographical one. Uh, even if you're up in Galilee, you know, we always say if you're up north, you go down south. If you're up in Galilee, people will say we go up to Jerusalem. And it's because Jerusalem was where the temple was. That's where people viewed that God resided. And so you're always going up to Jerusalem. It's just minor detail. But they're walking along. They've left Jericho. They're on this journey. Jesus is, uh, uh, I find something interesting here. Where is Jesus in the crowd? Look for that. Where is Jesus in the crowd? Is he lagging along behind, uh, being dragged along? Of course he's not. He's leading the way. Uh, now that God has affirmed and reaffirmed him, uh, I, I mentioned earlier when he came down from the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, it said he turned, in the Gospel of Luke, it says he turned his face toward Jerusalem. Uh, uh, another translation says he turned resolutely for Jerusalem. Once Jesus knew this is where I'm supposed to be going, the time is ripe for me to, to, to die, Jesus is leading the way. Thank you, Michael. He's headed right on up to Jerusalem. This is the third time that Mark tells us that Jesus has told his apostles what's going to happen to him. He's already said twice, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be killed, on the third day I'll rise again. He adds some details this time. He says it's the Gentiles whom he'll be handed over to. It's the first time he said that. The Gentiles, of course, were the Romans. The Roman, uh, the Roman uh, governor was the only one who had the authority now to, to execute, to use capital punishment. The Jews will turn him over to the Romans. Now notice what else he says. I will be mocked. Remember the, the crown of thorns, the old purple robe that the soldiers put on him? Spit upon. The soldiers spat on him. They, they spat on him the, the, uh, uh, at, the, at the trial before the Sanhedrin the night before. Some of the elders, the Jewish elders, spat on him and slapped him. He says, I'll be flogged. That was a horrible, cruel punishment. And that was done, of course, by the Romans. What this tells us in this third encounter with his apostles about it, Jesus knew every detail of what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. It's so, uh, it, it's so poignant to know that he's leading the way and all the time he knows what's going to happen to him. Now, he's going to pray in the garden that this cup be removed if possible, but of course he submits to his Father's will. Okay, Becky, one, no, two more readings. 35 through 40, please. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? That's through 38. Did you want through? Uh, through 40. Okay. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. By the way, this is a, a little detail, but Jesus answers really wisely when they say, we want you to do whatever we ask, okay? And Jesus says, uh, uh, and what is it that you, what do you want me to do for you? He doesn't make any promises without knowing. One of the gospels says that James and John's mother came and asked this question. It's almost like that gospel writer couldn't bring themselves to say that James and John, John the apostle Jesus loved, he's his favorite, and James his brother have come asking this question. Um, what does it say about them? What does the scripture say about James and John?
Okay, somebody says they're a little bit arrogant. Yes, very ambitious, right? Sitting at the left and right. Uh, the person on the right is second in command. The person on the left, third in command. Uh, they had no filter in what they're willing to say to Jesus. They're being very frank, very, uh, very honest in asking this. But they don't really know what they're asking. And, Jesus, and they don't yet understand what Jesus has just been trying to teach them about servant leadership. Come to me like a little child. This is not coming to him like a little child. They're not quite getting it. I find it interesting when he says, you want to drink the cup of, yeah, somebody says, uh, Brenda says, full of themselves, self-righteous. They thought they were, they were deserving. Let us be your, your second and third in command. Uh, Jesus says, do you think you can drink of the cup I'm about to drink? And they say, yeah, yeah, we can do that. It's interesting, they did drink of that cup. The cup was giving his life. Uh, James, the brother James, was the first of the apostles who was, uh, who was killed. He died as a martyr at the hands of Herod. And John suffered and was exiled for his faith. We think John was the John who wrote uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, I won't read it, but in 41 through 45, because we're just about out of time, we are out of time, uh, Jesus teaches more about servant leadership and says, don't lord your possessions over the people who are assigned to you like the Gentiles do. And he says, even I came, let me read that last part, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'm guessing that James and John were kind of embarrassed about that. Uh, even God's Son came to serve rather than to be served. It should teach all of us humility, especially when we find ourselves in positions to lead. Our role is one of the servant as we lead and not uh, holding our position over, over others. I know we didn't quite get to blind bar to mass, but I had planned not to. We'll do that at the beginning of next week's lesson uh, in chapter 11, and that is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So read chapter 11, and we'll we'll cover the last little bit of 10 and all of 11 next, uh, next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you all. Have a good evening, and I hope to see a bunch of you in church on Sunday, and I hope others of you uh, are worshiping with us online. Good night.